Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. So, um, when it comes to electric cars, a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years. So I wanted to start with just going a little bit back because it's difficult to remember what the industry looked like and what the mindset was. Today, we all think of Tesla and Formula E and maybe some think about our car. But just 10 years ago, this was the status of electric cars. This is what the people were thinking about electric cars. Ugly, slow, not something you want to buy, not really sexy. Before I go on to the future, I also want to give you um, a little bit of background about uh, how I came into all of this, because I guess a lot of you here are entrepreneurs. So this is uh, me 10 years ago when I was, or actually 12 years ago when I was uh, 18 years old. I bought myself a 1984 BMW because I was crazy about cars all my life. So this has really started just as a passion. Um, so I wanted to uh, do something with cars. And before this, I was the national champion for electronics and innovation. I had two patents before I was 18 years old and represented my country all over the world on innovation and electronics uh, competitions. But finally, when I was 18 years old, I could buy a car, but I was doing quite stupid things with that, like this. So of course, the car didn't survive for very long, so the engine blew up, and I decided to convert the car in my garage into an electric car. Why an electric car? I was born in Croatia, just as Nikola Tesla as well. And as you know, Nikola Tesla has invented the alternating current electric motor. And I was always fascinated by him and his invention. So I was always wondering why people build electric cars that are boring and slow, because the electric motor is a perfect machine to power anything, especially sports cars. So I converted this BMW in my garage, uh, wanting to prove that electric cars can be exciting and fun. And I started to race other um, gas-powered cars. So, of course, at the beginning, the car wasn't very good. It would fall apart. It had lots of problems. But after every race, I kept coming back to my garage and improved the car. And after some time, the car became faster and faster. It started winning. This was in 2010 when I uh, won the first race against gas-powered cars. And then in 2011, I broke uh, five world records with that car for the fastest accelerating car. I used the car every day for... Um, going to the university and uh, in snow, in the summer, in, in the winter. So it was a great learning experience. But what I actually wanted to do is build a full car from scratch to use the potential of electric cars, to use the full potential of electric motors. Why this picture? Because I was just a guy in a garage in an industry that's dominated by huge companies that are bigger than my country, Croatia. And if you... Google automotive industry in Europe, this is the picture that you will get. So uh, this is where the industry is. And Croatia is one of the very few countries in Europe that doesn't have any industry. It was really difficult to get the company off the ground. When I started, I couldn't ans ask anybody for help and for advice because nobody was doing anything similar in Croatia. So I went to the University of Mechanical Engineering and asked them if they can help me to build a car in Croatia. And they told me it's impossible to build a car in Croatia. The sooner you give up, the less people will go under with you. So, of course, I didn't listen. I was very stubborn. And, uh, but no venture capital funds, no experience, no government support. It was really, really difficult to get the company off the ground. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, finally, in 2011, we have presented the first car, the Concept One, which was the world's first all-electric hypercar. So let's see what this car can do. So I guess the professors at the university were wrong. You can build a car in Croatia. 
which is pretty fast. So we never wanted just to build electric versions of sports cars. We wanted to build really something better, not just for the sake of environment. I mean, with the few cars that we are building, we are not really going to make a big impact, but to change the perception of people. So Jeremy Clarkson is a bit like he hates electric cars, or he hated electric cars. Uh, Tesla actually sued them because uh, they were when, when they tested the first Tesla, the Roadster. And Jeremy actually said that the car is brilliant and it changed his mind. So I would say in the last 10 years, not because of us, but because of Tesla, Formula E, of us, and, and everybody else in the industry, the change of perception of electric cars is done. People think about electric cars differently. So the Concept1, our old car, the C2, a uh, new car that we just shown in Geneva this year, 1,900 horsepower, 1.85 uh, seconds to, uh, from zero to 100, and so on. So what we really wanted to show here is that electric cars can be better in almost every regard than gas-powered cars. And of course, beautiful. This is an amazing looking car, uh, very comfortable, very useful for the category it is in. And completely developed in-house. That's something that we are very proud of. We have over 200 engineers working on this now. Uh, we are developing everything, the battery, the powertrain, the chassis, the whole car is developed in-house. And on one side, we have our supercar business. On the other side, the main business of the company, which also bootstrapped the company, it, uh, which made the company survive, was developing components for other car companies. So our technologies are today in many other brands, and we are developing cars, helping other companies, the big ones and the small ones, to develop future technologies. So with this, uh, we have grown from this little garage where I built this BMW into now almost a 500 people company uh, in basically eight years. Um, but the next challenge and the next frontier is autonomous cars. So when I talk about this, keep in mind I'm a petrol head. I love cars. I love cars since ever, before I can even remember. Uh, I love to drive cars, and if I had the money, I would have 50 cars in my garage, and out of those 50, probably 45 would be gas-powered. Uh, so having said that, with this new breakthroughs, of deep learning and artificial intelligence, developing uh, autonomous systems became available. It became possible. Um, so what we are trying to do, when I started 10 years ago, electric cars and driving fun was not working together. People were like, how can this work? Like electric cars are not fun. And now the same thing is happening with autonomous driving. Like autonomous driving is going to take driving away from us. But I want to show, or we as a company want to show, that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We can enhance the experience. We can enhance uh, driving. So what we are developing is a driver coach, which can help you on the racetrack, for example, show you two perfect laps. And you, you know, you are like sitting with a Formula One driver behind the steering wheel. And then when you take over, the car helps you to be get a better driver, to help you approach your limits. When you go over the limits, it blocks you. It helps you not to... Uh, not to do something stupid, like Richard Hammond did. I'm not sure how many of you know what happened after that. I forgot to put that in the pre presentation. But everybody says that autonomous cars are ready, but the regulators are slow. I wouldn't agree. That's not really the case. If you really try to build a car today, there's lots of limitations and lots, lots of problems. So, for example, the actuation, steering, braking, there is no systems today on the market that have the redundancy and the architecture yet to really be a self-driving car. You need lots of computing power, which still today is very expensive to put into a car. Data is a huge topic. So when you develop a car, you need to store the data 15 years. And one car, one test car, which is, for example, driven 1,000 hours per year, uh, it generates six petabytes of data. That six petabytes costs almost a million euros. So if you, if you have an uh, autonomous test car fleet of 50 cars, it's 45 million euros just for the storage. So these are some things that people don't uh, really talk about, and these are some really big limiting factors. Like we had to build a data center next to our company just to store the data or, that the cars are generating while testing. And then we have uh, legislation and uh, how the customers will adapt and so on. There is something really interesting also. Uh, it's called the MIT Moral Machine. 
where the computer gives you several scenarios and tries to figure out how you would react. Like if there was two choices, how would you like the car to react? Should the passengers in the car die or the people on the street? How your decision changes if the people were running over a red light and you were on a green light? How your decision changes if there are old people in the car and young people on the road? And many different factors. Of course, this is a very, very corner scenario, but to make this mainstream, it has to be really safe. And I want to put things into perspective. So the people dying in traffic accidents, it's like a full Boeing 737 falling from the sky every hour of every day, which is 1 to 1.2 million people a year. If just a fraction of that would be happening with actual airplanes, none of you would go into, into airplanes. But we accepted this as something normal because it just happens. People just die. And we don't feel like in airplanes because we are in control or we think we are in control. To put numbers behind it, so the total, total cost of accidents in the US is $871 billion per year uh, for 2014. That's 9% of the GDP of the US, which is 90, uh, 29%, 29 cents per mile, which is a bigger cost than gas or depreciation of the car. So the accidents cost actually more than it costs you to fuel up your car per mile. So the single largest component according to some calculations of cost per mile is actually accidents. Then if you take into consideration the time wasted behind uh, the wheel, so it's 50 billion hours in the US again, which is 8% um, uh, of GDP. So if you put those two things together, the accidents and the time spent behind the wheel, it's a huge factor. So currently, elect uh, normal cars are used only 4% of the time. So with autonomous shared cars, that can go up to 70% or more. So the cars will travel a lot more than they do today, maybe 250, 300,000 kilometers per year instead of 20 to 30,000 kilometers per year today. One robotaxi can replace more than 20 cars. So 4 million robotaxis could replace half of the cars in the US, so more than 100 million. Uh, and there are some interesting facts, like, for example, 80% of the police is dedicated to traffic. What happens with the police when uh, they are normal drivers? What happens with the airports? Because uh, a significant share of their revenues comes from parking. What happens with the real estate market? Because distances are going to change completely. Uh, I'll have to accelerate a little bit, but the real question is what happens to the huge industry, the auto manufacturers and the tier one suppliers? So what I think is a key message here it's not just about driving. It's not just about the transport. It's a huge change. It's maybe one of the biggest changes that humanity can do over the next couple of decades. In the productivity increase, as we know, we are in a capitalist society where we always have to have growth uh, despite limited resources. This is one of the ways to maintain that growth, to give people the time they spend behind the wheels, to utilize the the infrastructure better, and so on. Another maybe more impactful change was that people eat less, less meat. But what I wanted to say here is really that it's not just about transport. This can be a huge change in our lives. Um, I'll just skip a few things because I'm over the timing. Uh, but uh, people ask when it will happen. Nobody really knows. I think it could happen very fast. So this is a picture from 2005. And this is a picture just a few years later. So change does happen fast, especially if considering uh, if it's convenient and if it's cheap. And autonomous cars will be much more efficient. You will not have to do huge upfront investment buying a car. It will be very convenient, very fast, very efficient. And it could even be, like some companies predict, completely free. So. Let's see what, will, what the future will happen, how the industry will adapt. But the key message is autonomous cars will drive electrification. And those two things combined with a new mobility concept will completely change our landscape and have a huge impact on our lives. Thank you very much.